Hi, my name is Kevin Starr and we will be covering the Control Introduction to the Single Loop Control Methods Digital Academy. Control tuning, that's what we're talking about with single loop control methods. Imagine, if you will, you were this young engineer who was given a uh, million dollar voltmeter. So you have a million dollar voltmeter, I want you to go tell me what the voltage readings are across these resistors. And you tell your manager this, uh, I don't know what a resistor is. And your manager says, I don't care if you know what a resistor is, I've given you a voltmeter that's a million dollars. Go. Can you see how there might be a conflict? The manager has the best equipment in the world. The engineer is missing a vital component to the equation, and that is knowledge. He doesn't know what a resistor is. So it doesn't matter what the equipment ha he has, he doesn't know how to perform the task that he's being asked to do. We're finding this scenario that is, is as absurd as it is and as uncomfortable as this poor guy gets, we put our engineering staffs at our industrial sites in this same mode every day. Except it's not a million dollar volt meter, meter, it's a multi-million dollar control system. And we are putting pressure on our engineers to tune them, to set them up, to configure them. It seems obvious, yet there's a vital component missing and it's called single loop control methods. That's what we're going to be covering in this course. Before we get into the nuts and bolts of control, why do we care if our automation system's working? What does that mean to you as an engineer and what does that mean to your customer or your customer's customer where the end product is going to end up? Just think about that for just a second. What is the benefits of a well-tuned control loop? So what if it oscillates? So what if it's turned off in manual? What causes that to be a problem. What we found over the years is these are some of the ones that come to the surface is if you have a control system that's not operating properly you can have upset customers in other words your product defects is not stable so they can't get a reliable product. You get your operators they just get aggravated they get fed up with the control system they just turn it off says why bother. You get defects, um, production barriers, you get instability in your process and you get valveware. That was a little bit of a of a silent uh, killer to the control world is your valves are all kind of twitch, twitch, twitching around and there's wear and tear and they eventually break. So you end up having what was sort of working in a bad way and then it just breaks and you have a catastrophic failure. But undeniably the area that gets your production group the most excited is this bottom one. Lost profits. If you know a little bit about proportional integral derivative and control modes, you can do substantial improvements to the overall efficiency and production of your process and your, your, your control system. In order to do that, we need to understand what these terms are. And not only what these terms are, like direct synthesis and ziegler nichols quarter wave decay, Pate approximations, Bode plots, proportional integral derivative, standard, parallel, classical, TI, TD, TF, you know, what are these things? And how in the world do they apply to process control? That's what we're going to cover in this class, is we're going to attack these items. So when we're finished, you'll be able to look at this screen and say, oh, I know what it means to have this type of a process. I know what it means to do a bump test. I know what it means to do a tuning. That's the secret. And that's what we're going to cover. In the early years of process control, a lot of times, and it was probably true, is the control network was more like a black box. They weren't highly precise, they were pneumatic devices, and they were very forgiving. In fact, the early days of control, they were literally knobs that you would adjust for proportional band or integral time, and they didn't even have numbers. You would literally kind of get what's called a tune by feel. I had an opportunity to tune a few of these kind of control loops and you really could kind of feel they would just the resonant frequency would stop when you would get the control settings. So that's where the term tune by feel came from. When we went to the electronic age, the digital age, you were putting in numbers. It's very hard to get a sense with your fingertips with numbers, um, which is where one of the issues or it sort of became called a tuning art is a tune by feel. That's very difficult to do in modern systems. So you have to know a few basic steps. How do I calibrate the process? How do I understand the dynamics of the process? How do I convert those ideas into tuning numbers? That's the secret. We can't look at control as a black box. 
Control performance potential. What we're trying to do is assume for just a minute that we're able to calculate what the ideal performance of your control system is. Assuming you have everything working perfect, what could you get out of your system? That's the ideal. And we have several, over the years, we've come up with very good trajectories and projections of what you can expect from a control system. But let's say if we operate this loop in manual, or this system in manual, where the operators are making all the adjustments, I would assume that over time your operators would start to figure out what worked and what didn't work. You know, if I touch that and I get hurt, I stop touching that. So eventually they start improving performance in a manual mode. But we end up with what's called a, per a performance gap or a performance potential between the manual operation and the ideal. Now we put our control system in. It's operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's just operating all the time. And typically during a project startup, people look at this and they're all working on it. And you can see you're following the trajectory very, very close. But the project eventually has to come to an end. The project folks move on. And what can happen is a results degradation. Matter of fact, we can measure that now. And we can see that this result degradation can happen with a half-life of about six months. That means if I had 100 loops tuned perfectly at the project phase, within six months, half of those control loops are going to degrade in some manner. We'll talk about that more as we go. So what's happening with these million dollar control systems when we just turn them on and leave them as a black box, we result in what's called an optimization potential. That gap corresponds to ROI. That gap responds to, is, uh, matches um, fiber usage or raw material usage or steam usage or you know whatever your raw material is. The more variability you have, the worse your production quality and throughput will be. That's what we're going after with this particular module. So by understanding some of those concepts, what is a model? What is a gain? What is a time constant? Your understanding of this, this improvement improves and you start to climb up the ladder until you can remove the performance gap. It's interesting, I was doing this class in India and one of the students came up to me and said, this reminds me of an ancient Indian saying and he, he mentioned it in his native language. I said, well, I don't, I don't really follow you. And he said, no, what that means is a man with one eye is king among the blind. What we're going to present in this particular training series is that knowledge that you're not going to know at a PhD level, but you don't have to. But we're going to give you enough knowledge that you will look invaluable to your customers and their customers. Removing performance, removing the gap is profitability, plain and simple. You get better runability, you get better quality, you get better predictions, you get a wider operating range. These are the benefits of a well-tuned control loop. I guess that's what I'm mentioning here. Higher profits, less downtime, less product instability, improved product quality. Your operator confidence goes up, so they start using your system. They start relying on your system so they can actually do things. Disturbances are always happening in an industrial process. They need to trust your control system. And when your operators trust your control system, that means you're making money. And your end customer is going to be satisfied and they'll be buying more from you. So just knowing these few things that we're going to cover here will allow you to have a dramatic impact to the production, performance, and quality of your end product. We have to look into this black box that we call control. That's why this poor guy looking into this black box and start pulling out things related to the process actuators, transmitters, filters, the controller, and then finally tuning. It's such a mis misinterpretation of control tuning to say, oh, I just got to throw in some numbers. No, there's a whole process that we have to follow. We have to understand this process. Tuning is actually the last step. If your troubleshooting method right now is to just throw some numbers and see what happens, this video series is for you. If you have recognized the complexity of working on industrial controllers from different vendors, if sometimes your numbers work, sometimes they don't, sometimes it oscillates, sometimes it's flat, and it looks like magic, this class is for you. And that's what we're going to look into, is to go from a black box to where we make it so we can look into there and get to quality, we have to go through process, actuation, controllers, and tuning. And actually those are how this particular course is laid out. Black box tuning is very much like this poor picture of this guy with a blindfold and a bunch of darts. And you say, the target is somewhere in this room, now I'll try to hit it. Now his only feedback is people that might be watching 
the f watching this is how would he know when he hits the target? He would only know by the reaction of those watching. If they were like, ooh, oh, you know, clap, he would say, I, you know, but he would eventually come in on it. But it would take a long time. It would take a lot of darts. And he may stop when he gets a positive reaction, but that may not be at the bullseye. This is exactly what we're doing in our industrial automation. Let's just throw some numbers in and let's hope the customers don't reject the product. And if they do, then we'll go change a different set of numbers. How many times have you heard a customer say, don't change anything, we're running really good? That's this black box tuning. We have to take the blindfold off if we're going to hit the target. That's what we're going to cover. Knowledge is the key. Technology changes, and, and it has over my career, it's now nearly 30 years, is it has changed dramatically from single loop controllers to chart recorders to corded in controllers to controllers that would fill a, you know, this entire room. You know, we've gone from maybe having a dozen controllers on a process to 400 controllers on a process, but our knowledge of how to tune systems doesn't change. Matter of fact, it's the same. The control theory, the applications, the mathematics behind this is really exciting, and it is constant. Technology changes, and as we get faster controllers and faster actuators, we can do more with our control than we ever thought possible. But the fundamentals, the thing that's the same, no matter what, is what we're covering here in single loop control methods, or feedback controllers, PID, feedback control loops, and we'll talk about that in the next session. Imagine you have a huge semi-truck and a Porsche. And you just got done driving the semi-truck, you, you're good at it. You know how to pass, you downshift to go up a hill, and then someone flips you the keys to his Porsche, say, go for it. And you hop in that Porsche, a very fast car, and you say, okay, take off. And you're like, you know, it's a car, it's a vehicle, I'll drive this Porsche just like I'm gonna drive this um, semi. What do you think's gonna happen the first time you jam on the accelerator? You'll probably shoot off the side of the road. You're, process is different, but your understanding of the control knobs, you didn't change. That's actually very similar to the world that we live in. I could have the same control loop on both of these processes, exactly the same control loop, but if I don't recognize that the process is different, then one of them is going to blow up. That's control tuning. When you can align the tuning numbers to the process, you can do amazing things. That's what we're going to cover. So you may be saying, I've never been tuned, you know, I've never been trained. <laughs> What's the big deal? I don't, you know, I find this funny. Is I used to not look anything like this picture when I started presenting this 20 years ago. Now I, I'm afraid, I'm not going to turn around because I think I resemble this. But what's the big deal? I've never been trained. I have to ask, how long did it take? How many darts did you have to throw before you got good? I've run into this so many times. Someone will have a particular control technology, and they're really good at, tuned by feel. They found these numbers work. Then they changed to a different control technology. Maybe they went from a, a, a Bailey DCS to a, an ABB DCS, or they went from Rockwell to ABB or Yokogawa or Mod 300, you, you name one transition. A lot of times vendors use different algorithms. So you may be an expert in one technology, but and when you change it, it becomes starting over. And now you get 20 or 30 years to practice to get as good as that guy that doesn't need training. We can teach you in this series how to get good very, very fast. You don't need 5, 10, or 20 years. We have to get there faster, and that's what knowledge can do for us. You know, we're all wearing several hats. We're all very, very busy. We don't have the time to learn from the School of Hard Knocks. That's why this is being put together. I've enjoyed the automation ride. I find it fascinating. I, was, I put this book together 20 years ago, and here we are um, sharing it. I've learned a few things in the 20 years. This book has sold, I'm guessing, 3,000 copies um, since we first wrote it, and now we're getting to put it together in an electronic series. And I'm very excited to share that with you because there's money here, not only for you but for your customers. This is the concept of reducing the learning curve. The school of hard knocks, the throwing darts until you hit the target, we don't have the time. We're too busy. We're too busy fighting fires. That kind of that whack-a-mole, you know, program, you know, you're hitting the, the one that pops up. We're in a firefighting mode. I, I just last week I had a customer say, you know what, My, I can't see everything. I can only see a small area, so I'm, I'm vulnerable over here. So what's happening is people are running and fighting fires. This technology, what we're going to learn here, will help ease the firefighting and get you ahead of the game by reducing the learning curve and in this case 
you'll be able to replay these videos. You'll be able to replay the exercises. You'll be able to go through it. That's what we're talking about. There are many puzzles, pieces to the control loop tuning picture. Filtering, actuators, quality, f gains, all those things. Tuning is just one. So when people say, well, I'll just throw in some numbers, it'll get better. Ooh, we need to step back a second and take a look at the control tuning picture and figure out it, you know, where in the chain of optimization am I broke. Yes, tuning is a piece of it. But this method that we're going to cover, it will take the magic or the black magic away and you'll find a process and a method and a series that's repeatable regardless of process, industrial application, or control technology. This, this information applies everywhere that has regulatory control, whether it's in is continuous process control, whether it's in pulp and paper, metals, minerals, mining, plastics, pharmaceutical, offshore oil and gas, I mean anything that has a continue, your car, you know they all have PID algorithms in it. So what we're going to cover here makes you very expandable and reusable. How are we going to do it? So what are we going to do? We have to first of all understand our process and we're going to talk about that. The first step is let's understand the process. Let's get a picture. What's a valve? What's an actuator? What's a dynamic? We need to understand those. We need to understand off control fluctuations. We'll talk about that. Then we need to slap a controller on it. Some sort of a controller that has you know, an ability to take an input like a reference and convert it into an output. We have to put it on control and then we have to take a look as did it get better on control versus off control. We have to understand that and we have to adjust parameters to try to optimize my control performance. If the loop is well tuned you can see you get a good regulation between the set point and the measured value. If the loop is poorly tuned it waves at you. And we'll talk about all this stuff. We're going to talk about how do you measure the, all of these. How do I come up with the process? How do I come up with the tuning parameters? And what do I look for? Did I actually get it? The validation step. We're going to cover that in this series. I like this picture as old as it is. It says we, this actually looked like our original control system. <laughs> it is, this poor thing is choking the operator. And it is literally standing in the way of quality and production. This is a mistake. If your control system is off more than it's on, it's doing this. It may not be reaching through the floorboards and choking your operators, but it kind of is. Is He can't see quality and production. He can't make informed decisions. He can't regulate your process to reduce raw material usage and increase production. Your control system is designed to help get you to quality and production, not stand in the way. So control performance, if it's off, it's broke, period. You can fix that. We're going to cover that. The spin-offs of knowing what we're going to cover here are, are vast. We can understand, by knowing a little bit of process control, you'll know what process can be optimized. You can get customers that'll buy from you again. You'll have less downtime. You'll have, be a value-added supplier. Increased production. Your troubleshooting time will drop like a rock because you'll know, is it tuning? Is it actuator? Is it transmitter? Is it the process? You'll, you'll know. And you can come up with more automation solutions than you ever thought possible in customer satisfaction. This class almost seems too good to be true, but it's true. And there's 90 to 95 percent of all industrial processes have PID feedback loops at the core. That's what we're going to be covering in this module. On this journey that we're about to take, where do we start? Well, first of all, we have to understand what a tuning step is. We have to be able to identify actuators and transmitters, understand some of the terminology, calibration, filtering. Then we have to identify the process. We have to understand if it, is it a first order or an integrating process because that changes the nature of the tuning. Then we come up with methodologies for how to do a tuning. How do we identify the process? How do we figure that out? How do we inject energy into this process and have it tell us what it is? And then we have to map what we find with the controller. And that's where we're going to talk about different types of controllers, different tuning methods. And the goal is to take the unknowns of our process and match them to our control. So once we match those, boom, that's when the good stuff can happen. That's what this class is all about, so let's get started.